Susan Sloan, today's guest, is the author of A Seat at the Table, Women, Diplomacy, and Lessons for the World, about the positive impact of having women work in diplomacy and leadership. She focuses on gender and equity to advise leaders on policy and diplomatic affairs. She'll share insights about her work and her superpower. I'm your host, Devin Thorpe. Welcome to the Superpowers for Good show, where we empower you. Susan, thank you so much for joining me for this conversation. It's so good to see you again after being with you in Israel. Thanks for having me, Devin. I'm excited to talk with you today. Yeah, you know, we had that extraordinary experience in Israel with just that uh, tremendous group of people that we we traveled around with and saw amazing things. Uh, what was your reaction to the trip? I had never been on a trip like that before. And I've been to the Middle East, specifically in Israel and the West Bank multiple times. And this was one of the most unique trips and experiences I've been on, mainly due to the people that were in our group and that everyone came with a different lens. We were all so different, although we're all American. We came from different parts of the country, different races, cultures, religions, uh, different ways of thinking. And, And being in that part of the world together was so unique and special and profound. And then meeting with the different leaders that we met with, coming from the lens of how we create impact for good. Wow, it was fantastic. Yeah, yeah, it, it was. It, it, I, I'm just thrilled to count the the seven people uh, you and I traveled with, a uh, group of eight of us, uh, as friends. Uh, I, I want to think of every person on that group as as a lifelong friend. Just an amazing experience. Can't wait. But, but um, Susan, I really want to talk to you about your book. Uh, you and I in Israel had so much going on. We didn't have much opportunity to talk about your book, but you've written this amazing book about women and diplomacy. Tell us about A Seat at the Table. So I wrote this book in eight months, Devin, A Seat at the Table, Women, Diplomacy, and Lessons for the World. It published right during the pandemic. And I interviewed about a little more than 30 women leaders, ambassadors, foreign ministers, government officials from around the world. And their take on leadership. And not only that, but how organizations, companies, governments can really reach gender parity and equity. And so it became more of than a book about women in diplomacy, but how organizations can really make an impact in that way. And the idea is not just to have, of course, women at the table or diversity for diversity's sake. The whole idea of why having different people at the table matters is to have diversity of thought. The way we think is different. And so that that creates change and epic proportions. So that's what the book's about. Now, I think you've got some data that suggests that having women involved in those key roles actually makes a difference on outcomes. A hundred percent. One, uh, it makes companies more profitable. Two, it makes peace treaties more likely to last and not fail. And the percentages are changing. I don't want to quote these old percentages that I have in the book because they've by far increased. But whether it's for the private sector or government or the nonprofit sector, having women at the table is a good thing. And uh, what kind of measurements are you looking at to establish that? Just to give us a a point of reference. So we're looking at Foreign Policy Magazine, the research they've done. We look at McKinsey. uh, We look at different governments that have brought women into different levels of leadership and how their foreign ministries have changed. Uh, at different levels of companies and organizations, whether we're looking at senior level leadership, like the C-suites, or even middle management, and how those changes affect company culture, profit, uh, how organizations retain their employees. All of those factors are, are research, are the key, uh, we call them key performance indicators, our KPIs of how we look at having women women at the table, what that looks like. And it's not only important to have women at the table, but also how do we keep them? Right now, there's many studies that are out there that show that women are leaving senior level roles because there's a lack of flexibility in the the workplace and they're not getting the support that they need. So right now, we're looking at how do we keep women when they get to the table in those senior level positions. That is a a critical, critical thing. I saw a piece this week that suggested women are 
retiring early and it's important more than ever to be engaging in this exercise of trying to keep women. You said something that um, I, I really, um, I struggle with a, <clears throat> a little bit. Um, and the it, it's a goal versus outcome question. Clearly, um, there is value in a diversity of thought and you could get the diversity of thought in different ways. But um, I, when I hear that phrase, diversity of thought as a goal, I sometimes hear uh, all lives matter, right? Uh, what I hear is people saying, it doesn't matter if the people around the table look the same and have the same background, just so long as we argue a lot. And uh, how do you react to that reaction? I'm curious. Well, diversity of thought means so much more to me. And, and, you, and you can't tell diversity based on someone, how someone looks, right? So when we're mm -hmm. looking at diversity around the decision-making table, we're looking at gender, we're looking at race, religion. Sometimes those things aren't coming up in data points. We're looking at socioeconomic status. We're looking at how people identify sexual orientation, all those different factors. Also, if you're looking in America, regionally where you are from the United States, your place of origin or internationally, your place of origin as well, all of those factors make people unique. And so when we're sitting around the decision-making table, if you have a bunch of people who've gone to maybe certain Ivy League colleges and just that set, maybe just from the Northeast, maybe from certain affluent families, those people, whether they're a different race or not, it doesn't necessarily matter. Maybe the gender matters a little bit, but they're from a certain subgroup, which isn't a, a reflection of probably the entire organization. So you have to have people at the decision-making table that reflect the organization that you've created. And if, if you want to have more profit, if you want to have a diverse workforce, if you want to have diversity of thought and coming up with better solutions than what you have now, it takes looking at who you have around the table. And the first thing is when you look around the table is to ask who's missing. I write about that in the book quite a lot, looking around the table and asking who is missing? How do we get them here? Yeah. Let me ask the question another way. Uh, could a reasonable could you reasonably conclude that a room full of middle-aged white men uh, are going to achieve the diversity of thought that is uh, appropriate in 2023 for a large organization? Well, Devin, I, I, I quote that question right back to you. Do you think a group of middle-aged white men can no. reach the No, I don't. No, I don't. But I'm not the expert. You are. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, that's what I get, that's yeah, why I get the, nervous, is, right? So the whole, uh, the, if we're looking only through a gender lens, let's only look through a gender lens yeah. right now. Forget about race, forget about religion, culture, origin, all of that. But just through a gender lens of men and women. And I'm not using male and female. The, the word choice is very important, men and women. And when we, we look at organizations that want significant culture change, and I learned this from an ambassador from Australia, and I write her story and the research in the book about this. She noted that to create significant culture change, and they did this in the foreign ministry, you have to have the breakdown of 40% men, 40% women, and 20% either. Now that 20% allows for flexibility because in your workforce, middle management and senior level leadership, you may not have qualified people, whether men or women coming through your door at a certain time. So that 20% allows for the flexibility of, of going and swaying different ways. So it's that 40, 40, 20 split, that ratio creates significant culture change. And so when you think about how you can institute that in an organization, okay, in senior level of leadership, Let's set some targets on how to get there. And by this year, let's get 30% of, you know, having women in leadership. By this year, 35%. And then by this year, we hope to get 40. And it can work. It, it does work. Yeah. And if you have those targets in mind, senior leadership, middle management, overall, 
that's going to change the entire culture of the organization and who you're hiring, what minds you're bringing to the table solely from looking from a gender lens. And so I challenge others, you know, if we think about this through multiple lenses, if you want to have a different workforce, not just looking at gender, that 40, 40, 20 split could be really fascinating in many certain lenses. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. I, uh, I, I'm embarrassed, uh, but at one point in my career, I had the opportunity to work in uh, a, on a, a team of powerful women working on an important project. And I was the only man in the room. And it, it did give me a whole new way to see how women feel, because I was often made to feel other different, uh, ignored, uh, disregarded. And, you know, we think, well, a group of women would never do that. But it, I can see, you know, it's, it's, it's the same way, right? We say, well, men aren't that way. Have, of course they are. Okay. And, and I saw that dynamic from the other side. Uh, and forgive me for pointing that out. But I, but I, so I really resonate with your message, 40, 40, 20, uh, because it brings that parody and it just i think it would in my experience changes the dynamic you you've got the data to prove it i just got one and you need both that. genders that's the important lesson yeah. we we can't just say oh we need more women at the table we need to have all women at the table i'm not saying that right i'm really saying you need both genders at the table to really create that magic because quite frankly we're good at different things and if we want to have the strength and empowerment at all levels of leadership we have to have both and guess what Life isn't equal. You can't ever hit that 50-50 split. It, it isn't realistic. And right, so when right. we're looking at that 40-40-20 split, that allows for flexibility. It allows for you to actually meet certain targets and it gives you room to grow. And growing is the essence of any organization. Yeah. Well, as you think about your book and uh, my interrogation, Forgive me, please forgive <laughs> me. But what would you want us to know about your book that I didn't elicit from my questions? The book is more than about women and diplomacy. It's really a, a select number of stories and research that has never been produced before. Every single leader I interviewed and sat down with told me two things. One, I've never told anyone this before, Susan. And two, I can't believe you just asked me that. So I knew I was onto something very, very special. Yeah, and so with yeah. those two things, when I when I set to tell the, to tell these stories and share these stories, uh, many young people coming to the workforce are looking for mentors. Whether they're looking for men or women, it doesn't matter. This is good leadership information. So if you're coming into your career, this is the book for you. Now, if you're in diplomacy, even more so the book for you. Now, if you are a senior leader in your organization, this is also the book for you because these stories show you, hey, how am I going to change as a leader? What, what areas and qualities can I take from these leaders that they're sharing this treasure trove of story and advice and the research to back it up? This can really shape my organization. I'm going to take these lessons. And when you look at diplomats around the world, oftentimes they don't share their stories. One, because they either can, aren't allowed to, or two, they don't want to be seen as a woman leader. They just want to be seen as the leader, an ambassador, a foreign minister, not the woman foreign minister, the woman ambassador. So it's very rare that they share stories that are very, very intimate. And so I believe that this book gives something to the world that we've never had before. And everyone who's read it, and you can go out on the different Amazon and all the places to find it, look at the reviews. They speak for themselves. I, I really believe that I was honored to listen to these stories and now share them with the world. Yeah. Well, uh, Susan, this is just uh, brilliant insights. I, I, I can't wait to finish reading your book. Uh, I'm excited about that. Uh, you are truly an extraordinary human being. It, it's been such a joy to get to know you a little bit. And I, I hope that that acquaintance uh, becomes a deep friendship. Uh, I, I want to, you know, I, I hope you'll be at my funeral 
Uh, you know. Devin, you're not going anywhere anytime soon, so you're going to have me as a friend for a long time. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. That's the goal. That's the goal. So, Susan, what do you see as your superpower? I've been thinking about this because I had a feeling you might ask, Devin. And I believe my my superpower is storytelling and sharing stories. And on the flip side of that, in order to have that superpower, I've had to learn the ability to listen and to listen really well. And that's something that's changed the way that I lead and that I experience things that oftentimes, yes, I may have something to add, but it's usually it's not as important as listening. And if you look at many leaders throughout history that have employed the power of listening, you find that they, one, have been very successful, but two, they're taking information and then they're using it and sharing it with the others. And so the power of storytelling is something that I've, I've really grabbed onto. And I've realized that because different people trust me and trust me with their stories, I have the responsibility to share it with other people. And so that's really my superpower is the storytelling. It's, it's an amazing uh, superpower. And I'm just, I can't tell you how jealous I am because I, I, I know what a powerful superpower that is. And I struggle so mightily to convert stories into stories. Right. Uh, it, it really is. It, it is a it's a big challenge. It's a big. So kudos, kudos. And um, can you think of an example of when you were able to tell a story and there was a great outcome as a result of the story being told properly? Let's see. Yes. Uh Last year, I was asked by the president of Georgia, and not University of Georgia, although I did go to University of Georgia, go dogs, but the president of Georgia in Tbilisi and in Europe. And I was asked to come over there for a conference uh, about women and how they're dealing with conflict. Uh, right now, Georgia is facing uh, different issues with some neighbors, uh, similar to what maybe Ukraine might be uh, dealing with right now as well. And Georgia got leaders together uh, from all over the world, all women, to talk about not only conflict, but what we can do to make a difference and create relationships and have resources. So I was sitting there at the conference. I, I monitored, I held a session, I moderated a session from Women War Correspondents. And it was a very powerful session. Uh, and later, when we were meeting with different women, I would share stories, not only from my book, but from different experiences and diplomatic experiences I've been in. And the impact of being vulnerable and sharing personal stories and also stories from other women created the atmosphere for other people to share their vulnerabilities that gave lessons of not only hope, but solutions of what women in Georgia can do. And so different leaders were there and, and even leaders from Ukraine were there. And that sharing of storytelling, I'm going back to storytelling, of course, really created an atmosphere that people were open, uh, candid, and you could feel it in the entire conference. Uh, and it was such a, a pleasure, not only to be there, but an honor. In addition yeah. to that, months later, the president's team reached out to me to write a letter about this conference that they could share in essence, give me a story that I can share with others so the conference can happen again. And so they entrusted me asking me to write a story about it. Uh, and that's just what I did. And I believe that, that power of being vulnerable, listening and sharing and creating that atmosphere, that was really impactful. Yeah, that, that is, uh, that's an amazing, an amazing experience. Uh, so uh, that, that is, Wow. Um, you know, again, uh, being jealous of your superpower, I want to know how to, to develop storytelling skills. Now, you hinted at one, didn't hint, you, you indicated one part of that is listening. But tell us, if you can, take a couple of minutes, tell us how to be better storytellers. I believe in the art of storytelling, you have, of course, you have to have beginning, middle, and end. But everything in between 
if you can be concise and yet detailed. And here's what I mean by that. When you set the stage for a story, if you're not a funny person, don't try to be funny. If you want to create a sense of vulnerability, then feel okay to be vulnerable. And it's also okay to mess up. People oftentimes say, oh, I, I'm not a good storyteller because I'm afraid of messing up or speaking too long. Read the, read the room, read the audience, look around the room. How are people reacting to it? And the best stories that, that I've heard, and the best storytellers that I love to listen to, uh, they usually don't speak with a lot of notes. They look at the audience. They have a little bit of movement. They're personable. They're relaxed. They're conversational. And you really do feel like you're sitting at their kitchen table listening to a story. And, and that's the real, I think, art of storytelling is if you can feel like you're at a kitchen table with somebody over a cup of coffee or a cup of water, a cup of tea, whatever it is, and you're sharing a story and you never know how it's going to impact somebody. And I've had people come to me from different parts of my life and have heard me tell a story in a certain way. And they've come back to me and said, oh, wow, you know, you I didn't know, like, I didn't know this, but that day, Susan, you told that story that really, that really resonated with me, that stayed with me. And I've, I've taken that lesson with me. And for me, that's not only the biggest compliment, but it's the charge to keep going and to keep telling the story. And so to all of you who want to be good storytellers, first, practice the art of listening. And then take that message of whatever the story is and share it with somebody else. And maybe it's a short message. Maybe it's a little bit longer, but add some spice to it and it should be a good story. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Great advice. Great advice. Well, Susan, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to be with us today. Be before we wrap up, would you take a minute or two and tell people how they can learn more about you, how they can uh, get a copy of your book, how they can connect with you on social media or otherwise, and, and know how to follow up with you? Thanks, Devin. Thank you for having me. And everyone, you can find me at susansloan.com, S-U-S-A-N-S-L-O-A-N.com. I'm on LinkedIn. You can find me there and I post on there quite a bit. So feel free to follow me. And I'm on Instagram and Twitter at Real Susan Sloan. But mainly if you go to my website, you'll get all those links. Uh, my book is everywhere. So whether you uh, order it on Amazon or any other local retailer or a local bookstore, they can order it for you please do. And reach out to me on LinkedIn. Send me a message. I'd love to hear what you think of the book and happy to have a dialogue about it. Yeah, fantastic. Susan, thank you so much for being with us today. We're grateful for your insights and all you've taught us about the power of women in diplomacy and the need to have. I love your 40-40-20 rule. So thank you very much. We wish you every success in continuing your critically important work. Thank you, Devin. Thank you for having me. All righty. Let's do some good. Thank you for tuning in to the Superpowers for Good show. Twice each week, we host changemakers who share their impact, insights, and superpowers. Don't miss another episode. Subscribe today at superpowersforgood.com. That's superpowers, number four, good.com. Be super empowered. Get your copy of the book, Superpowers for Good, as an ebook, audiobook, paperback, or hardcover edition via your favorite online retailer. Interested in having me speak to your company, organization, or association? Visit devonthorpe.com. Then, let's talk. Now, keep using your superpowers for good. Together, we can reverse climate change, improve global health, and eradicate poverty.